If it's Wednesday, the latest bombshell less than two weeks to go as Donald Trump's former White House Chief of Staff, General John Kelly, goes on the record in a rare interview calling Mr. Trump the definition of a fascist. Plus, newly unsealed intelligence revealing the potential for Russia and Iran to incite violence in the U.S. following the election as federal and local officials brace for the potential for turmoil and unrest on Election Day and beyond. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken urges Israel to end the war in Gaza as Israeli strikes pound Lebanon, killing Hezbollah's likely next leader. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington, just 13 days out from the election, if you can believe it. And with early voting underway across much of the country, we are tracking the fallout from a stunning on-the-record condemnation of former President Donald Trump by his longest-serving White House Chief of Staff, retired four-star General John Kelly. Kelly telling the New York Times in a recorded interview that he was deeply troubled by Mr. Trump's comments about using the military against his domestic political rivals and that, in his view, Donald Trump meets the definition of a fascist. Looking at the definition of fascism, uh, it's a far-right, authoritarian, ultranationalist political ideology and movement characterized by a dictatorial leader, centralized autocracy, militarism, forcible suppression of opposition, belief in a natural social hierarchy. Um, so certainly, in, in my experience, uh, those are the kinds of things that he thinks uh, would, would work better in terms of running America. It fall, certainly falls into the, into the general definition of, of uh, fascist, for sure. Now, Kelly told The Times that during his tenure at the White House, President Trump wanted personal loyalty over loyalty to the Constitution, and that he expressed contempt for disabled veterans, and that he had even praised Adolf Hitler. He would, uh, he would be commenting more than once that, you know, that Hitler did some good things, too. I said, you know, sir, if, you, if you, first of all, you should never say that. <laughs> but if you knew what history Hitler was all about from the beginning to the end, uh, everything he did was in support of his racist, fascist uh, life, you know, you know, philosophy, so that nothing he did, you could argue, was good. It was certainly not done for the right reason. And, um, but he would occasionally say that. The Trump campaign dismissed Kelly's comments, calling them fabricated, saying that the retired four-star general had, quote, beclowned himself. The Harris campaign today seizing on Kelly's comments as it intensifies its closing arguments that the former president is unfit for office. This is a window into who Donald Trump really is from the people who know him best. And it is clear from John Kelly's words that Donald Trump is someone who I quote, certainly falls into the general definition of fascist. Donald Trump is increasingly unhinged and unstable. And in a second term, people like John Kelly would not be there to be the guardrails against his propensities and his actions. So the bottom line is this, we know what Donald Trump wants. He wants unchecked power. The question in 13 days will be what do the American people want? As John Kelly said, Donald Trump doesn't understand the Constitution, nor does he respect the rule of law. Uh, if there was ever a red line, uh, he has stepped across it. Meanwhile, the former president is ratcheting up his personal attacks on the Harris Walls ticket, including last night in Battleground, North Carolina, baselessly suggesting that Vice President Harris is a substance abuser. Does she drink? Is she on drugs? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. She's a low IQ individual. Remember, she's a stupid person. She's totally unfit for office. No one respects her. No one trusts her. No one takes her seriously. And something is clearly wrong with her. Something is wrong with her. Something's wrong with her. And something's wrong with this vice president. He is off. She can't put two sentences together. I'm competing against this stupid person. 
Now, with the race so close, the big question is, will any of these developments move voters, even a small subsection of voters? Our friend Chuck Todd writes in his column today, ultimately, this campaign is likely to come down to whether Trump's character is problematic enough for some GOP-leaning suburban voters that they hold their noses and support someone they politically would normally not support. We're going to talk to Chuck in just a moment. Vaughn Hilliard, though, is with the Trump campaign in Georgia, and Yamiche Alcindor is following the Harris campaign in Philadelphia. Vaughn, let me start with you and these striking comments from General John Kelly. You've been talking to your sources inside the Trump campaign. What are they telling you? What's the reaction? This is a candidate in Donald Trump who is really running his campaign strategically and communications-wise, Kristen. And so for his campaign advisors, there is no effort to right, soften the impact of the criticism of his former chief of staff, John Kelly. Instead, it is to take John Kelly head on. You referenced a statement from the spokesman that suggested that John Kelly was beclowning himself with his statements about Donald Trump. But you see from the candidate himself, who we are now just seeing for the first time here today at an event down the road, not far from where we are in Georgia, uh, uh, somebody who has a history of lashing out against his former administration officials who had spoken out against him. James Mattis, his former Pentagon secretary, said that Donald Trump wanted to divide Americans instead of unite. You had the likes of another defense secretary, Mark Esper, speak out against him. H.R. McMaster, his national security advisor. You have Rex Tillerson, his former secretary of state, his former national security advisor, John Bolton. Really, though, what John Kelly's words, though, is really for the first time you hear directly from somebody that worked so closely with him calling him an authoritarian. And I want to let you listen because I mentioned for Trump and his campaign, this is about responding and making these individuals a part of the campaign. Take a listen to Donald Trump on the campaign stage last night in Greensboro, North Carolina. When Putin saw how weak we were, how pathetic we were with the stupid Millie and these generals that aren't even generals as far as I was concerned, what a stupid group of people they were. Mattis, Millie, we have a great military and they're not woke. Some of the stupid people up top are woke. We have seen Donald Trump speak out against those who have criticized him by suggesting, oh, but they are the ones that encumbered him from being an even more successful first president, and that he, come 2025, will ensure that he is surrounded by campaign advisors and cabinet members who are uh, duly efficient or duly uh, loyal to him and carry out the wishes of the Republican Party and the MAGA agenda. So for Donald yeah. Trump, this is really a moment here where he is taking some criticism head on, at the same time using that criticism to try to galvanize his most faithful supporters to put him back in the White House. And Vaughn, as you've been speaking, former President Trump is talking there in Zebulon, Georgia, where you are. Talk about the strategy in Georgia, a place where Trump clearly now feels Feels he's on a bit of defense. What have we heard from him today? Right. These are the seven battleground states that you're looking at, and polling shows them close everywhere. Georgia, North Carolina, where he spent the last two days, are really two of those states that he needs to win. If he does not effectively win these two states, it's going to be tough for him to get to 270 electoral college maps on, the, on, on, on November 5th. But for him, again, when we're talking about, uh, Kristen, about the type of leader that he wants to be, part of that message is making the case that he and uh, the use of the executive branch could be more effective than relying on Congress, Mitch, may have a Democratic majority, for example, in the House. When we're talking about immigration, for example, we have heard him talk so much about immigration and pushing back against the criticism that he helped uh, stymie and bring an end to that bipartisan bill up on Capitol Hill earlier this year. He has gone around the country telling crowds, including just this week, that uh, you don't need a bill, you need a president. And for Donald Trump, that means him. And the suggestion is that the White House, and particularly one who is effectively able to use the power of the White House, is the answer to so many of America's problems. That's coming from Donald Trump. Kristen. All right, Vaughn Hilliard in Georgia for us. Key battleground state. Vaughn, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yamish, let's head over to you in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Obviously, the biggest battleground, 19 electoral votes. So the candidates will be barnstorming this state between now and Election Day. 
talk about the strategy in the wake of these John Kelly comments because they really fit into what we've heard from the vice president, these closing arguments, quite frankly, that she's been making, which have revolved around trying to make this argument that we heard when President Biden was at the top of the ticket, that Trump is a threat to democracy. And it's striking because obviously reproductive rights, Democrats know that's something that energizes their base. But she's really putting the focus on this idea by John Kelly and more broadly speaking that Trump is a threat. That's right, Kristen. The vice president and her entire campaign uh, are really seizing on these, these, these comments by former chief of staff John Kelly and really wanting to underscore that what he's saying about the fact that former President Trump fits into the category of a facet that that really is just connected to their overall messaging and the thesis that they've been making that's been part of their campaign, which is that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. So we saw the vice president do something that she's rarely done, which is deliver remarks um, and, and really talk about the fact that not only is this problematic and dangerous language um, when you hear this from people who know Donald Trump best, but she also made the point that if Donald Trump were to be reelected, he wouldn't have people like John Kelly back in the White House with him. So in other words, he would be, in her mind and in her words, more unhinged, and he could use the military to, to do all sorts of things that would be going against the U.S. Constitution. We've also heard Governor Tim Walz talk about this. He says, as a 24-year military veteran, he, these comments and this idea of Donald Trump comparing himself and wanting uh, Adolf Hitler's generals to be like the generals of the United States, that that makes him, quote, sick. So they are really, really leaning in on this. And we expect uh, to hear the vice president and her running mate and a number of campaign surrogates continue to talk about this, Kristen. Meanwhile, Yamish, our friend and colleague Hallie Jackson, sat down with the vice president yesterday. They covered a range of different topics. What were your key takeaways? They did cover a range of topics. I think one of the top takeaways from this interview was that the vice president says that any sort of negotiation that impacts um, women's abilities to really have um, control over their own bodies when it comes to the issue of abortion is a non-negotiable. Take a listen to a moment where they were talking about that topic. So is a question of pragmatism then what concessions would be on the table? Religious exemptions, for example, is that something that you would consider? I don't think we should be party? making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. To Republicans like, for example, uh, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, who would back something like this on a Democratic agenda if, in fact, Republicans control Congress, would you offer them an olive branch? Or is that off the table? Is that not an option for you? I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals because we can go on with a variety of scenarios. Another interesting moment from that interview was that Vice President Harris said she thinks that the country is ready for a woman, a woman of color herself, to be president in a topic that she has not wanted to engage in, like in, in, in any big way, um, but a topic that she was very comfortable talking about in this interview, Kristen. Yeah, very different strategy than we saw with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, for example. Yamish, thank you so much. Joining me now on set is NBC News Chief Political Analyst Chuck Todd, Betsy Woodruff-Swan, National Political Correspondent for Politico, Faz Shakur, Senior Advisor to Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, and Republican strategist Doug High. Thanks for being here. Betsy, let's start with these comments by John Kelly, obviously getting a lot of attention, but the big question is, are they going to move the needle? Or are they going to bring anyone into the Harris category? I want to play a little bit more of them and get your reaction on the other side. He's certainly the only president that has all but rejected what America is all about and, and what makes America America in terms of our constitution, in terms of us, our, our, our values, uh, you know, the way we look at everything to include family and government. And he's certainly the only president that I know of that was certainly in my, certainly in my lifetime that was like that. What do you think the impact's going to be? I don't think it's going to be as helpful to the Harris campaign as she and her team are banking on. There's mm. no question that they see this as an enormous political boon, that it's something the vice president wants to talk about in her town hall tonight, that it's a theme she's been leaning into so hard in these key final days of the campaign. At the same time, though, it's very much of a piece with what so many former Trump White House yes. officials have been saying for three years now. The fact that his closest advisors, including his closest national security advisors, have said he's a danger, he engages in this type of disturbing activity and rhetoric, these allegations are part of a long-running theme, and they're not part of a theme that has resulted in making this race 
clean cut and easy for the Harris team. Yeah, Chuck, do you think that John Kelly speaking out encourages other Trump officials to speak out? And, and could that be something that moves the needle when we're talking about the inches of this race? Well, what's interesting, and I wanna, I wanna piggyback on something that yeah. Betsy just said is, I think we need to step back and realize how strategic the Harris campaign has been today just about this topic. Mm -hmm. If you had any doubts about how they were gonna close, there should be no doubts. Right. If you have any doubts about what the theme of her speech is gonna be on the national mm -hmm. ball, I think I know, we just heard a preview mm -hmm. of it. They've yeah. decided to close on this match. It's, there's two ways to look at it. It's the one voter that's left that she can get. Mm -hmm. This is an incredibly hard voter to get. But you need to, you have to work Explain at it, work why. at it, work Explain at it. This why. is a Republican voter who probably has voted for Trump once or yeah, twice. Right. And you've got to get them to do something that perhaps they've never done before. And not only that, Harris might be more liberal than any Democrat that they have mm. ever encountered. And they're likely, I mean, here, let me give you an example. State of Pennsylvania. Bob Casey is trying to win over a Trump voter to win. Right. And now she's basically trying to win over a McCormick voter right. in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And the reason I bring this up is because the and this is true of both sides. The closing messages for the Democrats down the ballot, Social Security, yeah. very curious what my man yeah, of is about to say. Right 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 I know, right but it's fascinating to me, so and I have no doubt there is a lot of already, what I'd say, the pre-Monday, we're Friday morning quarterbacking. Right. If there's Monday morning quarterbacking yeah. after the election, this is the, wait a minute, are you sure you want to start this quarterback? Yeah. Right. Um, right. We're Friday morning quarterbacking here. But it is interesting to me that the Democratic messages down the ballot are all substance, mm -hmm. all, you know, rights. mostly two issues. Well, Social Security is the other one. It actually yeah. has been bigger. Yeah. I can tell Faz has been involved. <laughs> um, but the, it is, and the, but look, whatever we think, we know what they think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Harris campaign is banking on something. But by the way, Trump is also banking on a voter that never shows up, a young male. Right. Okay, so it is That's interesting right. to me that both of them in this, I, I sort of now say we're about to crash land. This yeah. is not an election that's going to be clean. <laughs> it's a crash landing, and we're going to have to go through the wreckage to figure out who survived. Yeah, well, it, it's a great point, and Faz, pick up on it, because do you think this is her strongest closing argument? I mean, as Chuck says, the down ballot candidates are talking about Social Security, are talking yeah. about reproductive rights, which we have seen in the midterms energizes voters, Democrats, to get out and cast their ballots. I'm not in love with it, but it's revelatory in terms of the closing argument. To add on to everything that Betsy and Chuck have said, the reason why you might want to emphasize Trump as a fear is because you worry that the 81 million votes that were there for Joe Biden are not yet there for Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what helps generate that turnout? It's fear of Donald Trump. He might be back. He might be a chaos agent. He's that close in the final days. So I think as much as you're also talking to the Republican voter that Chuck has mentioned, you're also just trying to gener yeah. generate enthusiasm and excitement. To so you get think out this talks vote. to the base too? Yes, for okay. sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. I would say it does more for mm. the base than it even even does for the Even more than reproductive rights? Uh, I mean, what, what it does with this argument, they've decided with the Liz Cheney and appeal is that for people like Doug, who, who are not always in love with Donald Trump, this might appeal to them. My, my argument, and it, I feel like the down ballots show this, so if you're Sherrod Brown, Debbie Baldwin, Bob Casey, you look at Dan Osborne's race in Nebraska, like Ruben yeah. Gallego in Arizona, what are they doing? They are fighting on issues of corporate greed, prescription drugs, social security, reducing cost of housing. I want to tackle substantive issues to improve your economic lives, and, that, and for that reason, I have much more confidence in where they're going to land at the end of the day than I have right now. About yeah, so I, think, I think his point is ultimately... They're talking about what voters are talking about. Yeah. And look, how many yeah. times have we had Donald Trump bombshells that never amounted to anything, really? Mm -hmm. You know, this is not an October surprise because no one's surprised. We've heard some of this already. Is there anything that we could learn about right. Donald Trump? No. I mean, there Bill Simmons October has the surprise? Tyson zone. Yeah. I think it's a Trump zone. I mean, Absolutely. What, could, what leaked audio of Donald Trump? You, oh, my God, I didn't right. know that. Hey, look, it was, it was eight years and two weeks ago where the Access Hollywood tape came out on a Friday night. Right. And I said, this election's over. Yeah. Right. The next day it was a rally. Right. I was I, said, yeah, I was yeah, in Raleigh at an election we didn't know, yeah. right. right? I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina at a Richard Burr event, and I said, oh, oh, wait, no, right. they're not leaving him. Right. And right. that's not changed. And yet we see down-ballot candidates talking about the issues that voters are talking about. Harris seems to want to stay away from those, yeah. and it's, I cannot fathom this. Let me read a little bit uh, more of what Chuck had to say in your column. Mm -hmm. The simple fact 
This is still a jump ball is a reminder that Trump is his own worst enemy. And if the final two weeks of this campaign are more about Trump than Harris, and you believe we are living in an era when the final decisive voters are more concerned with whom they don't want in the White House than whom they do, then Harris may close stronger at the end than Trump. Chuck. I, it, it is, it is, I understand, like I said, I get their theory. I think it's her only path to victory. Mm -hmm. I'm just, it's a treacherous path. So you think it's a narrow path? It's a narrow path. But you start to look at these intangibles. He's going after a voter. Again, I always laugh at this. Like, he does really well with voters who didn't vote in 18, 20, and 22. Right. Okay. They didn't vote in 18, 20, or 22. <laughs> <laughs> the likelihood that they're going to vote in 24. Right. Like, you know, how he's connected with young men, he hasn't said what he's going to do for them. Right. He just simply says, hey, my, my lunch table's cooler than the, her lunch table. And, and yet, Don't you want to hang out here? And then yeah. you're like, okay. And I've seen young men go, oh, he's funny. But it hasn't translated to a vote yet. Yeah, and the question is, will it? But so much of the focus has been on energizing young male and male voters, African-American male voters. Betsy, that's where a lot, I mean, women voters as well, obviously, but a real focus on that from both campaigns. Yeah, no question. And it's clear, of course, that if Trump is able to peel off just a point or two in terms of Harris's African-American support, you lose states, you lose congressional districts, you, you, you lose the makeup of the House of Representatives. It's existential for Democrats that they just do really, really well with that voting block. Yeah. Of course, what I find striking is the issues where Harris is willing to compromise versus the issues where she's not. And some of this gets back to these former Republican voters. She's walked back where she stands on fracking compared to 2019. Mm -hmm. She's walked back some of the very progressive policy stances that she took in that primary where she's not compromising, where she won't give an inch, is on these re reproductive rights issues. Mm -hmm. Even when Hallie, of course, posed it as a religious exemption yeah. issue. Very much Hallie asking a question where you know Liz Cheney would have wanted to hear one answer, and it was not the answer that Harris Harris gave. Yeah. And that, of course, is a position that's appealing very much to uh, voters where reproductive rights is the top issue and they don't want to see any compromise. Yeah. She ahead, was the, you know, she, one of her strengths was going to be the change agent. And if you look at how it played out after Project 2025, you know, the Democrats did a great job of making sure everyone knew about Project 2025 and hated it. And then kind of moved off of that. And in that period of time, what Donald Trump has done is done no tax on Social Security, no tax on tips, no tax on overtime, no tax on car loans, no tax if you're on active duty, something, something. Mm -hmm. Every day he is pulling policy out of his ear and saying something. He's going to go to McDonald's. He's going to talk to working class people. He's going to show up at a Steelers game. He's going to go on some podcast and tell you about how he cares about the direction of this economy. And on the, on the Harris side, you have sensed much more cautiousness. Yeah. If, you, if I had to ask you in the last one month or two months, what new policy have you heard? I would say it's Medicare, home care, right? That's Medicare rollout. On Social Security, how do you get defeat on Social Security? He's now right. got a no tax on Social Security in which, to most people, sounds like a benefit ad. ad. How do you get cut? How do you get beat on that? Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, to that point, it, the race is tied if you look at the polls. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, I was in Pennsylvania yesterday, it feels like Trump's got a lot of momentum. Yeah, you're like the weather person. But again, There's the temperature. But the feels like temperature. And I'm always like, what do you just tell me what it feels like? Like, what are you going to two different numbers? I'm kidding. I'm, I'm no, kidding. but this is very good weather forecasting. Yes. Good weather. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the reasons it's all we for that have right now. Yeah. is we, we also see that people are voting already. And yeah. when I look at the North Carolina numbers, my home state, what we see is Republican numbers are up, not massively, but they're up. Democratic numbers are way down in North Carolina, and that is very surprising because that's what they tend to do best. It also tells me when whatever happens at this, when we look at the wreckage after the race, voters are safe and secure. They feel that the vote is safe and secure, regardless of what happens after the election. Here's the other number, yeah. of course, that's really fascinating is Nevada, where we're mm -hmm. seeing Republicans yes, do much right. better yeah. than anyone expected. And it's especially striking, given that Pretty much all the reporting indicates the Nevada Republican Party is a huge mess. Yeah. Just a mess. And but, fact, but I'll be honest, yeah. I, 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 an early vote, yeah. you know, I take all of those anecdotes and throw them away. I all usually do too. No, but even, I would, but here's why I would throw the them all away. We're seeing Republicans I'd throw them all away. in the wake of Trump's Here's what I promise. Fraud. I promise okay. you this fact. There'll be more Democrats that vote on Election Day than did in 2020, and there's going to be more Republicans yeah. that vote early than mm -hmm. they did in 2020. This is comparing blueberries to apples. Yeah. Okay. If you gave me comparisons to 16, I might be curious. Yeah. But I think 2020 is such an outlier in how... Yes, because I mean, of COVID. People, there's right. a lot of people who are Election Day voters who are also rank-and-file Democrats right. who prefer to vote on Election Day. Yeah. And they're, they didn't because they trusted their government and were worried about health. But they're going to go back. So, look, 
I, you know, it's interesting. Both parties have always different stasis in the last two weeks. Republicans are usually confident to overconfident, yeah. and Democrats are usually, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Are usually yeah. like my, uh, a friend of mine emailed me, he goes, I'm not a bedwetter, but I, after reading this poll, I really right. have to pee. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, okay, we know who you are. So there is a little bit of like, and that's why I take all these early votes, and I literally just, they're as, they're as worthy as the garbage. Saz, what, what about you? Do you take them, is the, I mean, for lack of a better term, are you getting the sense that people are starting to bedwetting? Do you have to pee? I mean, no. <laughs> we're, we're, I mean, I agree with you, we're very early, and you take the numbers against 2020, and you're like, well, Last time, the Republicans actively right. urged people not to vote early, right. not to vote early. Yeah. And, and this was during COVID, in which we expanded the accessibility of voting. And so Democrats were taking advantage of it. We're right. more COVID conscious. So the numbers, the apples, they don't work. And so, I, yes, I believe there is so much time left in the early vote. I, I take all of this with a grain of salt. Just right very now. quickly, though, do you think Harris, if she wants to regain the momentum in these final days, does she need to put more meat on the bones of oh, yes. some of these policies? Chuck talked about what we're anticipating from her closing argument next week based on what we heard today but what does she need to say to voters clearly this is what a Harris administration would look like versus Joe in Biden. 2020 I thought Biden did a fine job of making it clear that it was an all of the above candidacy mm -hmm. from all the way mansion to Bernie to everything in between but Trump was in power it was a fire sure. camp. Yeah. It was but, a fire camp. but you were able to make the clear the coalition believes in my direction mm -hmm. And I do think that now you've gotten a push, right, from Liz Cheney, like, we need to get the Republican, soft Republican votes here. And you haven't seen, standing with, you know, you name your progressives, but it's not that that part. She sent Bernie and Biden up to she, New Hampshire. She, she, That's worthy. Very, very she quickly, because I'm getting a rap, is Liz Cheney making a difference? Very quickly. I don't know, but I'll tell you a comment that would have been stronger from her, and I'm curious what you think of this. What if she had said... I hope this is the last time I have to vote for you. Mm. Yep. And not and, and not not being an insult, mm -hmm. but I think for her to be more effective to get Republicans, yeah. I think the case you have to make to Doug High mm -hmm. is good. Look, this is a one-time vote, so we can get the conservative yeah. party back. Yeah. I think she needs to make that finish the sale. Does she that's, need to tailor her message? I, I, th I think that's right. And ultimately, it's much like with with the story that um, you know unleashed today. These are bombshell things that we all talk about. Your average voter just isn't focused on that. And your average Republican voter, not even av average, yeah. Republican voters, very and, small and, sliver. And remember who's left. Mm -hmm. yeah. The people who are left yeah. are the least engaged voters because they've waited till now to decide. Right. They're like, yeah. uh, cause they've like, I don't want, they're the ones that said, yeah. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They tuned right. us out. They're That's the right. ones that turned it off. That's right. So they're going to be less engaged yeah. by, they wanted to be, yeah. and now here we are. All right, guys, amazing conversation. Thanks for starting us off strong today. Chuck, Betsy, Faz, and Doug, really appreciate it. Ahead, we'll dive deeper into the Harris campaign's closing argument, what we were just talking about, and strategy with campaign co-chair Congressman Robert Garcia. But first, new intelligence reveals that Russia and Iran could try to foment violent protests right here in the U.S. following November's election. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The legal fight over the election is already getting underway. According to a review by NBC News, battleground states have been flooded by close to 100 lawsuits, some of which could shape how votes are cast and counted. It comes as NBC reports that state and local officials around the country are taking major steps to protect election officials amid the increasingly hostile political environment. And in a newly unclassified assessment, the intelligence community says it's increasingly confident that Russian actors are considering and in some cases implementing a broad range of influence efforts timed with the election. The assessment also warns that both Russia and Iran may try to incite violence. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian joins me now. So, Ken, this is terrifying. In addition to everything that folks are concerned about when they think about this election cycle, the idea of having that type of uh, influence from foreign adversaries really unnerving. What are the key takeaways from this assessment? Well, the first thing is it's remarkable that they released this much information. Mm. I've never seen that before. You, the intelligence community is really trying to lead, lean forward this cycle to get the message out that our foreign adversaries are interfering in our politics in a way to try to inoculate the public. If you see a deep fake video, it might be a foreign adversary. But this, this, this aspect of they might foment violence, that is really frightening because you know millions of people are receptive to the idea that there is election fraud and what this intelligence assessment says is that Russia and Iran specifically are primed to sort of 
uh, foment that message and, and spark protests. And they have a lot of capabilities. They even have the capability to disrupt election networks through cyber means. But this document says that they don't think that they will do that because there would be a huge risk of U.S. retaliation. Ken, of all of the concerns, what's the biggest concern? Obviously surrounding the violence, but within yeah. that. Well, there's two. There's, there's also the idea of confusing people about when and where to vote, mm -hmm. which could suppress the vote, say, in a key swing state on Election Day. Deep fake videos have, could do that. And then, as you said, it's this idea of spewing out disinformation about fraud, getting people to disbelieve the results and, and, and sparking violence. And Ken, why was it unclassified now? Well, they've been doing this regularly. They've been doing regular briefings, and they've made a decision in this administration to get this information out, as opposed to 2016, when it was all happening behind the scenes. They knew the Russians were interfering, but they didn't give us the details until much later. Mm. Let's shift gears a little bit, talk about what's happening in Pennsylvania. Elon Musk, Trump supporter, billionaire businessman, is offering cash giveaways for folks to register, to vote. The Justice Department sending him a warning today. Walk us through that development. That's right. And so the issue here is that to enter this contest, you must be a registered voter in whatever swing state we're talking about. And some legal experts have looked at that and said, wait a second, it's illegal to pay people to register to vote. And this is essentially a de facto indirect payment to, mm. to register. Other legal experts disagree with that. It appears the Justice Department is not completely decided about whether this is illegal, but they've sent a warning letter mm. to the PAC. Um, it's not clear how the PAC is going to react to that. We haven't seen the letter, obviously, but it's a significant thing that shows that they, the Justice Department is paying attention. This is a lot of money that is sloshing around these swing states uh, from the world's richest man. Absolutely. And I interviewed the governor of Pennsylvania this past Sunday who mm. did suggest that officials look into this. Thank you, Ken Delaney, Thanks, and I appreciate all of your reporting today. Coming up after the break, an inside look at Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign's closing strategy. Campaign co-chair Congressman Robert Garcia joins me next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. As we mentioned, Vice President Harris sat down with my colleague Hallie Jackson. She was pressed to clarify how her administration would be different from President Biden's and whether she viewed his record as a political liability. Are the last four years an obstacle to you in this race? Here's how I look at it. First of all, let me be very clear. Mine will not be a continuation of the Biden administration. I bring my own experiences, my own ideas to it, and it has informed a number of my areas of focus. Joining me now is Harris campaign co-chair Congressman Robert Garcia. Congressman Garcia, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. So hard to believe, but here we are with just 13 days left until Election Day. I've been talking to some undecided voters who say they still want to hear more specifics from the vice president. They want to have a clear sense of how a Harris administration would be different from a Biden administration. Do you think she needs to go even further in distinguishing herself and separating herself from President Biden? Well, I think two things she's made pretty clear, um, particularly the last few weeks. I mean, one is that she is not Joe Biden. She is her own person. She has her own ideas. Uh, clearly, she has a record as a senator that one can look at the way she always stood up for working people. Um, she's been attorney general of California when she took on big banks and large corporations. I think you'll see a lot of that Kamala Harris as president. Um, but also, she also, is, and I think in these last few weeks especially, gone out and talked to numerous members of the media, not just, of course, here on NBC uh, just yesterday, but 60 Minutes, so many other formats, mm -hmm. podcasts, interviews, one-on-one. -on -one. She continues to do so. So I think there's been... Uh, to get questions in of the vice president. I um, mean, she'll continue, by the way, to roll out more plans. She just yesterday put out a new agenda, for example, for Latino men, for new economic opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, new tax breaks, uh, new investments in the construction trade. And so her policy proposals continue to come out. I encourage folks also to check out her website. There's a bunch of policy proposals on that site. Um, and much more extensive, by the way, than anything Donald Trump has put out. You know, it's interesting. Today she came out, she focused on this message, the revelations by John Kelly that he believes that former President Trump is, in fact, a fascist. He talks about the fact that he praised Adolf Hitler. And she's really focusing on this idea that Trump is a threat to the democracy. That seems to be her closing argument. Is that what we can expect to hear next week when she delivers her actual closing argument here in Washington on the Mall? 
I think you are going to continue to hear that exact thing, not just from uh, the vice president, but from former Trump officials, from his former chief of staff, former generals. This idea that somehow Donald Trump wants to have generals uh, and those that follow him like Hitler did is shameful. It's disgusting. It's unhinged. And I think it leans into this fact that Donald Trump, as Kamala Harris has been saying, is unfit and unprepared to be the president. And at this moment, she is going to make this closing argument that there is a contrast and a choice. And the choice is between a vice president that has the support of working people, that has done a great job to President Biden as well as a partner, against someone that continues to be more and more unhinged every single day. And as you've reported on this network and other places, Donald Trump's comments continue to become more bizarre and more strange. And that's something that should concern the American people. And I think in these closing days, Kamala Harris will make that argument. You know, I was just talking with my panel here about the fact that a lot of the candidates in down ballot races are more focused on issues like Social Security, like reproductive rights, which we have seen not only in special elections, but in the midterms, for example, really drive out voters. Do you think it's a missed opportunity not to focus more on reproductive rights and other issues that really energize voters historically? Well, I think she's focusing on all of them. I mean, she's going to be in Texas, as you know, uh, the huge um, rally and, and, and discussion just about abortion rights and the way that reproductive health care has been stripped away from women in Texas and across much of the country. And so she will continue to talk about reproductive rights. It's uh, one of the top things I hear about when I'm going traveling the country uh, for the vice president. And so it's going to be reproductive rights. It's going to be Donald Trump's being unfit for office. It's going to be uh, the attacks that he led on January 6th, which I think are going to be highlighted and will continue to highlight in these closing days. And it's going to be the contrast between what he wants to do to move us backwards and her investments in Social Security, in Medicare, in lowering the cost of health care. So all of that will be part of this conversation. Um, all of that will be part of the closing message. But I think at the end of the day, when people cast their vote these next two weeks, they're going to think about Donald Trump and whether or not he can actually do this job and deserves to do this job. And I think the vice president is going to win that argument. Congressman, we have reporting about concerns within the campaign that the vice president is on shaky ground in some of the blue wall states. Do you think she can win the White House without winning a Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin? Is there another path or does she have to win those states? I mean, look, we all know the, we've all done the electoral math. Uh, clearly winning those three states is key to the campaign success and key to the win. We, Are you we all concerned? Know. Are you concerned about what you're seeing in those states? I, I, I'm actually quite heartened by what I'm seeing in those states. I think if you look at the early vote number, for example, you look what's happening in Detroit with early vote, you look what's happening in Pennsylvania with the early vote, um, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling quite heartened. Now, let's be clear. Kamala Harris herself said on day one of this campaign, this was going to be a close election and that she was going to run like the underdog. This was always going to be a close election. So, of course, everyone is working hard. Of course, everyone has concerns that we all want to win. Though I would much rather be the campaign that we're running and where we're at right now than where Donald Trump is. And so, yes, we are going to win those three states. That is our goal. And we're also ensuring that we expand the map. That's why places like Georgia, which, again, the early vote is showing really good news mm -hmm. for us, is so important. That's why we got to go all in in places like North Carolina, where I think polls, most polls now are looking at us tied, uh, looking at us in a, in a place where we are feeling really good about where North Carolina is. And that's why we're working hard in places like Nevada. So yeah. this is a expanded map. We're going to continue to focus, of course, on those three states. Congressman, let me ask you about a key vo voting block that obviously both campaigns are focused on, Latino voters. The latest NBC News Telemundo CNBC poll shows Harris leading Trump among Latino voters, but that her advantage is at its lowest level compared to the past three presidential elections. Why do you think Trump is making inroads with that critical group? I think I think look I think the main thing I hear and I hear this from some of my you know, my cousins and and Dios as well is there's a lot of misinformation out there there is a mm. lot of misinformation in the media on social on on social media in some of these podcasts non-traditional media sources that are now becoming a bigger part of information consumption I also think we have to work hard to always ensure that we reach out directly to Latinos particularly Latino men look Kamala Harris yesterday 
put out her economic agenda for Latino men. It's about doubling home ownership annually to 600,000 home, home, home buyers a year and giving down payment assistance. It's about ensuring that small business owners have access to uh, forgivable loans. And, and I'm the most also excited about her ideas for the construction trade. She wants to ensure that when you're buying construction tools, that you get essentially a reimbursement for those tools. We know that so much of the construction industry is also Latino men. So she has and has put out plans. We're all over this country talking to this critical group. And the last thing I'll say on this is really important. Latino men are and should be concerned with the women in our family, with our moms, with our tias, with our abuelitas, and how they have health care, low insulin costs, reproductive health rights. And so at the end of the day, we need to vote not just for our own interests, but for the interests of our family. And I think Kamala Harris is making that closing argument. Congressman Garcia, I have a lot more questions for you, but we'll have to invite you back. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great talking to you. Coming up next, the very latest from the ground in Israel as Secretary Blinken urges Israeli leaders to end the war in Gaza on his latest trip to the Middle East. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. A lot more ahead. Welcome back. The Biden administration today making its most forceful push yet to get Israel to end its war with Hamas. Since October 7th, a year ago, Israel has achieved most of its strategic objectives when it comes to Gaza, all with the idea of making sure that October 7th could never happen again. Now is the time to turn those successes into an enduring strategic success. And there are really two things left to do get the hostages home and bring the war to an end with an understanding of what will follow. Secretary of State Antony Blinken made that plea as he left Tel Aviv this morning. It comes as Hezbollah confirms that one of its top officials who was expected to become the group's leader was killed in an Israeli strike. Israel, meanwhile, continues to strike Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon and as it weighs potential strikes on Iran. NBC's Raf Sanchez has the very latest from Tel Aviv. Hey there, Secretary Blinken departed Israel today en route to Saudi Arabia and his parting words to the Israeli government as he boarded his plane was that the U.S. sees it as critical that when Israel retaliates against Iran for that October 1st ballistic missile attack, it do so in a way that does not trigger a new cycle of escalation. The U.S. wants to see a kind of Goldilocks strike, big enough that it sends a message to Iran, small enough that it doesn't trigger a regional war. That is obviously a difficult calculation to make. Israel's defense minister was at an air base here a little earlier today, speaking to the pilots who will carry out that long-range strike. And he was saying, making very clear, it is a question of when, not if, that Israel retaliates. The Israeli government is also signaling it plans to hit back after Saturday's Hezbollah drone attack, which we are now learning had actually damaged the private residence of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a little further up the coast here. That is a fact that was under military censorship in this country for several days. It is seen as an absolutely massive security failure. You can only imagine if a militant group was able to to launch a drone that damaged the private house of President Biden in Delaware, the kinds of questions that would be asked. Meanwhile, we are seeing just a spiraling humanitarian crisis in northern Gaza, where Israeli forces are besieging the Jabalia refugee camp. They say that they are pursuing Hamas militants who have regrouped there. But the U.N. is warning that food, medicine is not getting in. Hospitals are absolutely overwhelmed. Rescue crews are not able to collect bodies that are piling up in the street. And just one grim data point, the United Nations today saying it's been forced to call off its polio vaccination campaign in the north of the Strip because Israel's bombardment is so intense at this point. So that is children inside Gaza who are not going to be vaccinated against polio because of the intensity of the fighting. Back to you. Grim update indeed. Raf Sanchez, thank you so much for that report. And still to come, we are checking back in with a leader of the uncommitted movement, which protested the Biden administration's handling of the war in the Mideast at the ballot box during the primaries to see where she stands now on the presidential race. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. With just 13 days until Election Day, both the Harris and Trump campaigns are barnstorming all the critical battleground states as they make their final push. Among them is Michigan, which is home to the largest Arab American population in the nation and amid criticism over Biden's handling of the war in the Middle East. Support from that voting group could determine who wins Michigan in a race that is already razor tight. Joining me now is one of the co-founders of the Uncommitted Movement, Layla Alabed. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And I should say Layla Alabed. Apologies for mispronouncing your last name. Let's talk about how you feel about this election. Your group objected strongly to the Biden administration's handling of the war in the Middle East and voted against Joe Biden during the presidential primaries. We are 13 days out from the general election, as you know. Have you decided whether you'll support Vice President Harris? Um, at the top of the ticket, um, I have decided that I will be skipping the top and focusing on candidates down ballot that align with my morals, align with my beliefs, that are champions of racial justice, climate change, and end to uh, forever wars. Um, and so my focus will be on the, the down ballot candidates here in Michigan. Is there anything at this point that could change your mind? For example, would you accept anything short of an arms embargo on Israel? What I would need to see from Vice President Harris's campaign is a promise that my homeland, my family members, people I care about in my community that have friends and family, not just in Gaza or in the West Bank and occupied Palestine, but also in Lebanon, in that entire region, mm. that our family members and our loved ones are gonna be protected. And we just haven't seen that. And, and just to be very clear, would the only way that you would feel that way be an arms embargo? It could look like an arms embargo, or it could just be, you know, um, adopting a policy that uh, you know, is in compliance with our own international laws and uh, our American laws that says we will not fund a foreign government uh, that um, commits war crimes. And there has been evidence after evidence that Israel has indeed uh, committed war crimes, and we should end that blind support in weapons funding to Israel. Um, and I think there should be a more diplomatic uh, uh, process to ending um, the war on Palestinians. Leila, your organization has warned about what you've called the dangers of a Trump presidency. Given that, why not vote for Vice President Harris and then work to hold her accountable once she's in the Oval Office? For some of us, voting, uh, you know, for Harris as a priority to block Trump extremism um, is, is priority. And there's going to be leaders and uncommitted voters that do cast a Harris vote. Um, but there's also going to be voters like myself who are Palestinian, Arab American, and Muslim American, and honestly, a voter who just doesn't want to see my tax dollars used to kill men, women, and children where, you know, frankly, Vice President Harris' unwillingness to adopt a, a more humanitarian policy, um, she hasn't earned my vote. I'm curious, what are you hearing from your friends, from your neighbors, from other folks in your organization? Are they also planning to leave the top of the ticket blank? Some folks are going to be voting for Harris as a way to block Trump, which I think is very important because we know how dangerous the Trump presidency is going to be, not only those who are concerned with foreign policy, but also domestically. I know how dangerous he is going to be um, to our own domestic policies. But at the same time, asking voters, even for myself, just watching the images come out every single day mm. from my phone, from my uh screen, just the devastation, the violence. For some of us, asking who we are going to vote for at the top of the ticket and be strategic about it is like asking who we're going to vote for while we are at a funeral. We are mm. in a deep state of grief. And it certainly does put into context how you feel. We only have about a minute left, but Given what you are saying and given what you are hearing from your friends, families, colleagues, do you think Harris can win a state like Michigan? I think it's going to be incredibly tough 
it seems that Vice President Harris has decided, her campaign has decided to continue alienating a core constituency here in Michigan and decided to win this election in Michigan without the base, without her base that, you know, many of us voted for President Biden in 2020. And it seems the signal that we've gotten from her and her campaign is that she is willing to risk that of a state like Michigan um, by continuing to alienate young people, Arab yeah. Americans, yeah. and Muslim women. All right, Leila Alabed, thank you so much for joining us. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.